and 96. I have 96, so please stand.
got your, got your bags packed and ready to go. We're just waiting for the wedding music. Amen? All right. Well, we're glad you're here today. What a great day this is. I trust your bags are packed and ready to go. If they're not, you're in the right place. We'll help you pack your bags and get you ready, okay? Let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, it's good to be in your house today. We thank you for this great crowd that is assembled here today. We thank you for this Thanksgiving Sunday and the preparations that have been made for this time of fellowship and really worshiping you, Lord, praising you, not just here in the worship service here, but downstairs as we break bread together and share testimony of how you've worked in our life this past year and how we're appreciative of the many blessings that you've sent our way, so undeserving as we are. Father, we're so grateful for your goodness. We thank you for these songs that we've just sung this morning. We are so blessed, such a, a blessed people, and we're so thankful for that. We are a blessed church, and we thank you for that. We thank you for how you've blessed us financially. You've blessed us. You've supplied all of our needs. Uh, there's not a need that we don't have need of that you haven't supplied that need, and we're so grateful for that. We thank you. Father, perchance there are those here today, though, that are troubled by the affairs of this life. We pray today, Lord, that they will look heavenward, look toward you, and draw strength from you, and they can rejoice in the blessings that you have provided for us, Father, this day. Pray for our church community, our church family, our, our church missionary family. We pray for them. We just lift them up to you today. We think of our nation. My heart, our nation needs a touch of your hand. We pray, Father, now after this election, that somehow righteousness might in some way stand in the gap and hold back evil, and we might be a nation that we were destined to be, a nation that adhered to the laws of the land that were founded upon biblical Judeo-Christian values, and we pray that we might adhere to that once again. Bless this day mightily. We call upon you today. Lord, we need your help today. Come and minister to us, to each of our hearts today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Well, this is Operation Christmas Child Sunday in our church I think the last day for collection shoeboxes is tomorrow. And Don and Jean, they're going to take the shoeboxes to New Hope this afternoon and drop them off. And we have a good selection of shoeboxes, 34 I think we have. And we just appreciate your generosity. The boys and girls, they're going to be blessed by these shoeboxes because when they go out, wherever they're going to, to whoever people they're going to, whatever language they're going to, they will have the gospel placed in each one of these shoe back boxes, uh, material, uh, that they will be able to read and be informed of, not just enjoying these gifts, but they can enjoy, to enjoy the greatest gift, and that is knowing Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. It's our custom before we just uh, take these boxes out, we, need, we believe that we need to pray over these boxes. We think that's an important thing to do. And so this morning, I need a volunteer that would love to come and pray over these shoe boxes. I just know I'm going to have all kinds of volunteers just ready to jump up here and do this. Do I have a volunteer? That's what I thought. That's exactly what I thought. No volunteers. Well, Brother Drew, I'm going to pick on you, brother. <laughs> Drew could see I was eyeballing him a little bit, so he knew I was zeroing in on him. Brother Drew, I want you to come up here, brother. I appreciate you a lot. You appreciate our brother, Brother Drew? Amen. I want you to pray over those shoe boxes, if you would, sir, and just pray for the boys and girls that are going to receive these shoe boxes. Absolutely. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you so very much for all that you've given to us. And, uh, Father, we just pray that you would take these shoe boxes and touch lives and and just to uh, actually give them life um, father we know that we're separated from the sin of humanity we've we've fallen short we've we've missed the mark Lord and we know that through your son that we can have eternal life and only through him so father as we give these these boxes these are your boxes they're they're what you what you want and what you want to do with the Lord. But I pray that people's lives would be changed. That they would get on the road to life. Eternal life. And that's only found through your son. And we're so thankful that we can do our part. Because we are blessed. You've blessed us. You bless us 
each and every day. And Father, just ask that you would take these boxes and change young boys and, and girls' lives so that they can have eternal life through your son. Father, we're thankful again for all that you've given to us. Just help us to extend that joy and that life-giving that your son has done on our behalf so that we can have eternal life with you. Again, thank you for all that you do in our lives, Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Drew. Appreciate that so much. Well, today, as we've said, thanks, this is Thanksgiving here at the church today after the morning service. We're going to go downstairs and break bread together. And after that time, we're going to read a few verses of Scripture. We might sing a couple of choruses. And we're going to give you the opportunity to share the blessings that the Lord has blessed you with, how He has blessed you. Maybe you just want to reflect upon the fact how He's blessed you spiritually and that he's, you've been born into the family of God through faith and you'd just like to share along that line. Or maybe the material things of life that God has blessed you. Whatever, however He's moved, however He moves your heart. We encourage you this, this afternoon as we, after we have broken bread together and shared together just to share with one another. You know, the, word, the Lord in His Word exhorts us over and over again to praise Him, to exalt His name. That's a part of our worshiping Him. I've given you a verse of Scripture in the bulletin, Isaiah 12, 4, and we're going to go to that chapter this afternoon and just comment a couple of things there from that chapter. It says, but in that day shall ye shall say, praise the Lord, call upon His name, declare His doings among the people, and make mention of His name is exalted. Declare His doings. You never know how you declaring how the Lord has worked in your life will impact others to draw nigh to Him and develop the kind of relationship that they need to have so that God can bless them. You know, when you're away from the Lord, God can't bless you. He can't be the Father to you. He wants to be. And He wants you to draw nigh to Him and come back to Him and be the kind of son or daughter He would have you to be. And the same thing is true in our homes and our families. Well, in the way of announcements also, don't forget the elders meeting and prayer meeting this coming Wednesday evening. And then next Sunday, Teen Mission will be with us. They've been trying to get with us last year. If it was uh, a date that they, they, they gave us and it wasn't possible that they could come on that date. So they're going to come this year. I know there's been a lot of missionaries coming fast and furious, it seems like, but I've even had individuals call and still want to come and I said you wait till the first of the year now wait till after the snow thaws and uh, but that's good that's a good thing uh, the Lord has blessed his church and I'm thankful for that and we, we talk about that but financially he's blessed his church tremendously um, and this church has been able to bless missionaries financially tremendously and every month over and above a certain number 5% is redistributed out and generally it goes most of the time toward missionaries and certainly missionaries can use that uh, help because of the inflation that we're dealing with in our land today. Do you see diesel some places six dollars a gallon that would give you heartburn in a minute if you have to go fill your tank up with that but uh, no doubt our missionaries are experiencing the inflation and it's hard on them too so we like to help in that area as a church and because of that God continues to bless us. You know that? If you have a clenched fist, if you have a clenched fist with the Lord, with your time, your talent, and your money, I promise you, you won't have near the blessings you'll have if you have an open hand with the Lord. You give Him your time, your talent, your money, and God has a way of blessing you uh, tremendously. Any other announcements that need to be shared that I haven't shared with you? Judy? In two weeks, December 4th, it's unfortunate, but it's my fault that this wasn't put in the bulletin. We are going to have a youth group um, activity again down in the basement. Um, we'll have lunch provided after church, and we are going to do an outreach to a nursing, a local nursing home. Um, we're going to make Christmas cards for the residents that don't have family that visit. Amen. And we're going to decorate Christmas cookies and have games for um, the youth first grade and up, so I encourage you all to come and join us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We have any birthdays this morning? Oh, we got a birthday. Happy birthday, Andrea.
celebrating 10 years. And, and Tom is celebrating. We don't talk about it anymore. <laughs> How about anniversaries this morning? Any anniversaries? All right. Take your hymnals again, please. Turn to number 82. Number 82, and please <coughs> Continue to keep Natalie in prayer as she's recovering from her surgery. Um, Colleen says she is making some headway, though, right? She's making headway. So she'll still be there in the hospital there for a while, but continue to pray for her if you will. At this time, Patty has a special.
Colossians 2, 6 and 7 says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built upon in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Church, you are dismissed at this time. Is your faith real? You know, there's a lot of people that talk about faith, say they have the faith. Adam thinks he has the faith back here. Maybe one day he will. I pray that he will. That's my prayer. But I want to leave, I want, to, I want us just to think about that thought we've been talking about faith for a number of weeks now, and I think it's fitting even on this Sunday. Uh, we've been speaking about this for over a period of about five Sundays, but it's been spread out because of vacation, because of pastor's retreat, and missionaries that have come in, and here we are in the Thanksgiving season, and we're celebrating these great days from the viewpoint of the cross because it was the cross of Jesus that made these days what they are. And the people who are the stars of this day, you know, we, we talk about the, the, this Thanksgiving season, the pilgrims, and we're coming into the Christmas season, Mary and Joseph and the shepherds. It was all made possible because of the cross of Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross. And we are called to walk this walk, the walk of faith, once we come to know Christ as our Savior. The great hurdle that we have to, the first great hurdle is coming to know the Lord as our Savior. Take your Bible and turn with me back to the book of 1 John chapter 5, and let's begin there in 1 John chapter 5. And I have just kind of a collection of thoughts. I don't know that they necessarily fit together beautifully, wonderfully packaged like they do with Adrian Rogers and David Jeremiah or any of that, but uh, they are thoughts that are certainly founded upon biblical truth and are thoughts that really come to us from this great chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. We started 
there when we started talking about faith. And, you know, you, you, you think about it. There's a lot of places you can look. But here we see many examples of men and women who live their life. And the Bible says, by faith, by faith, by faith. I didn't count how many times last night, how many times that's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. But there's a number of times that it's mentioned. So if it says that, it must be pretty important. And I would think today that in the world that we're living in today, like the world they lived in, God still expects that of you and I this morning to live our life by faith. And we need to trust the Lord because, man, we're so tempted. I don't know about you, but I am so tempted to take matters into my own hands. Are you that way? Do you find yourself wanting to take matters into your own hands, wanting to solve your problems your way with your philosophy and your thoughts and your ideals? Well, sure you do. And the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God. Well, born of God, you know what that is, being born again. You've come to know Christ as your Lord and Savior. You recognize the fact that you're a sinner, that you fall short, you've missed the mark. Uh, the mark that has been established, the Scripture says there's none righteous, no, not one. And you and I have to understand that first and foremost. And Jesus Christ came to pay a debt that I could not pay so that we could have a gift that we do not deserve. And so he says to us who have received that wonderful gift, who are celebrating Thanksgiving, who are counting our blessings, who are looking forward to the Christmas season, he says, for whatsoever is born of God. And listen, we just don't read the Bible and read history and read about those that preceded us that live by faith. That living by faith has to be relevant in my life today. If I've been born of God, I'm his child, and he expects me to live as his child because he has his fingerprint upon me. You have the name of your father upon you. I would imagine your father said to you at some point in time, remember when you was walking out the door, whose name you have. You represent this house. Did your father ever say that to you? Anybody ever? Sure. I got one hand. Anybody else? I got a few other hands. Absolutely. Andrew, did your father ever say that to you? I know he just walked in. I'm catching him flat-footed. Did he ever say that to you when you went out on a date? <laughs> he will. He will. He'll tell you whose house you represent. And if he don't tell you, come down to Grandpa's house. I'll be sure to tell you. <laughs> but you are a child of the King, and you represent the God of heaven. And the Bible says, uh, says here, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. The world is all of that that we go out there into every day to make our living. The people we rub elbows with in the hospitals and the nursing homes and the places of business and all of that which comes against us. It says, it says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. The world wants to conform you, wants to bring you back into its web. The Lord Jesus Christ won you to himself. But I will assure you this morning, the world wants to win you back. To itself, And it's striving to do that. And the Lord is admonishing us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ that when we are born into the family of God, we have something within us that enables us to live differently in a world that is broken and, and corrupt. The world is what it is because it has not come to Christ. It's because of the sin of Adam. And it has polluted the bloodstream of humanity. And how wicked is humanity? Well, just turn on your evening news and you'll, you'll find out how wicked humanity is. Listen to some of the talk shows. Uh, some of my favorite, you know, The View. That is one of my favorite talk shows. It just blesses me to no end. You really get, a, you really get blessed as to the depravity of the human mind when you hear some of the things that are said. But God says to us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, not just personally, not just personally, not just that we live and walk in victory personally, but this living and walking by faith impacts the world in which we live in. How does it do that? The Bible says we're light. The Bible says we're salt. It says this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So we have to come to Christ first to be a victor and to overcome this world. So we ask ourselves the question this morning, what is required in walking by faith? And I'm just going to double back on a couple of the points I've already given you briefly this morning. 
and uh, just to remind you of this because I think this is so important. We talk about walking by faith, and sometimes you find fancy little cute definitions, and that's all fine and dandy, but walking by faith is simply being obedient to the Word of God. Walking by faith involves our obedience to His Word, trusting God for His strength day by day, and trusting His provision. Now, when you go back to Hebrews chapter 11, and you read about these men and women, the times in which they lived and what God called them to do, they were pursuing what they heard God say, and never received in many cases what God said to them. They, in some cases, did not receive what God was saying to them, but by faith obeyed what they heard God say. God said to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'm going to give you a lamb. But as I was reading and studying that last night, it was some 500 years after the promise was given to them and after they were gone that Israel actually became Israel and Israel actually possessed the land. But yet, they marched toward that promise. They marched in obedience to that promise. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. Through faith, it says, these all died in faith. Hebrews eleven thirteen. these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Not having received it, but having seen it afar off. You know, uh, you think about prayers that have been prayed. I was thinking as we did the funeral for Brother Richard this past week. And by the way, we appreciate these beautiful flowers. Aren't they gorgeous? I wish I could grow flowers like that. I am so jealous. <laughs> They're beautiful. But uh, I was thinking as that funeral uh, at Richard's and how uh, prayers that have been prayed, Amen. prayers that have been prayed, are still yet to be answered. And sometimes we get discouraged because we said we haven't seen the answer. But you know, this verse of Scripture, these all died in faith not having received the promise. They prayed the prayer not even having seen the promise, but the answer is still coming. The answer is still coming. You know, this church is blessed today because there have been many patriarchs of the faith in this church, and we can name some great names of men and women who were here Roll back the clock 20, 30 years ago, and maybe not even that far back, but we we're, were here and prayed for their church, prayed for the well-being of their church, prayed for the financial stability of this church, prayed for the attendance of this church, and they never lived to really see the great blessing that God was beginning to bless even now. The financial stability that this church has is incredible how God has blessed his church, a small country church in northwest Ohio. It is a, it is a blessing of the Lord. And uh, they never seen that, but they prayed to that end. And you have prayed to that end in regard for individuals that, that you know and that you love, that they would come to Jesus Christ. And it's possible that you could pass from this life, but that prayer is still yet to be answered. Still yet to be answered. And we read this here. These men and women, these all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off. They were convicted in their heart of what they heard God say. They moved in the direction of the word of God, trusting God for his strength, day by day, trusting his provision. When God calls us to live and walk in a world that's broken like the world we're living in this morning, he wants us to take this word that we hear and move in the direction of this word, regardless of how the rest of this world is trying to conform us into its image and become like it, become faithless, to, be, to move by sight and not by faith. That's what the world wants us to do. It wants us to be reactive, just like it is. It wants us to become men and women just like on The View. That is disgusting. That's not living the kind of life God wants us to live. It, it wants us to become just broken like it's broken. And God doesn't want us to be broken like it's broken. God wants us to move in the direction that he's called us to move in. You might have prayed for someone in your family or someone near to you. You might have prayed for their healing. And the healing might not have come as of yet. Well, you continue to pray to that end. And that healing will come in time. If it doesn't come in this life, definitely it will come in eternity. Because in eternity, we'll be 100% whole. Amen? Amen? That'll be a wonderful thing to look forward to. But, you know, as I was thinking about this verse of Scripture, I'm reminded for the rapture. I would love to have the rapture come today, wouldn't you? Wouldn't that be awesome? I would hate to miss Thanksgiving meal, but I bet there'll be a better Thanksgiving meal in heaven that is awaiting us. But, uh, but uh, uh, you know, we long for that. 
And it could very well come, and we pray that it will. And it certainly seems that it should come in our lifetime from the things that we read in the Word of God. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And certainly what we read about in the days of Noah, if you go back and read it, we're witnessing it today in our world today. So it's certainly we are ripe and ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it could very well come. But if it doesn't come, it doesn't mean that it's not going to come. It doesn't mean that it's not going to come. And just like it says here, these all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And dear friend, this morning, that's what you and I are. We're strangers and pilgrims on this earth. So the question, when you walk in faith, how deep is your devotion? How deep is your devotion? When testing and trials and hardships come, and when answers to your prayers haven't come as of yet, will your anchor hold? Will your anchor hold? Will you continue to walk in faith and obedience to the Lord. The Bible says these all died in faith. They didn't, they didn't believe on a God for a little while. They believed on God all the while. And these men and women died in faith because they had a living faith. Well, you know, walking by faith involves our obedience. It involves trusting His Word, trusting Him for His strength day by day. When I go to school, when I'm out at work, when I got a business meeting, when I got an appointment, when I got a challenge before my life that I certainly don't know what to do, and even if I think I know what to do, I need to entertain that problem, that need, that burden before the Lord and ask the Lord to have His will in that situation. You know, in the front of my Bible, I have written this down, and it's a reminder to myself from a preacher's point of view. And it says this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 20. It's not you that speak, but it's the spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. So when you go to the pulpit, Sunday school teacher, when you go to the lectern, Sunday school teacher, and you're all studied up and prayed up, remember this, it's not you that's spouting off. It's the spirit of the living God using your big mouth, your mind, your body, your vessel as his vessel, and he is proclaiming his word through you. Remember that. Walk by faith. Now, what else does walking by faith involve? Well, when I look at this chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, you look at many passages of Scripture. When you look at the lives of these individuals, they had to make changes. I've told you many times when the Lord moves into an old house, what does He do? He begins renovation. He begins changing that old house. He moves things around in that old house. He begins to remodel. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear. Moved with fear. You know, when the Lord God of heaven speaks to your heart and my heart, we ought to do like Noah did. We ought to move. We ought to move. We ought to move in the direction that God is calling us to move in. Do you know the voice of Almighty God when He speaks to your heart? Do you know that unction that comes from him, that unction in your heart that he's speaking to your heart? Move in the direction of it. Well, do you know, Lord, I'm afraid of this. I'm, I'm a little fearful of this. Move in the direction. Trust God by faith. That's what these men and women here did. That's what the, these men and women here did. They had challenges, but they moved in the direction that God was calling them to move and it involved changes on their part. It got them out of their comfort zone. God doesn't ever leave you in a comfortable place. Have you ever noticed that? God loves to call us and put us in positions that is not a comfortable place. Now, God called Noah. Go with me back to Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. I can, I can preach all morning, can I? Because we got dinner downstairs. Your beans are not burning at home. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. Notice what it says there. It says this, A man's heart deviseth his way. Isn't that the way it is? Isn't that the way? It is? We plan our day. But notice it says, But the Lord directs his steps. Listen, when I walk by faith, I have an agenda that's before me this week. But when I walk by faith, I say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Guide my steps. Order my steps in your Lord. I don't know what Noah was doing before God called him. But as soon as he called him, the Bible says he moved with fear. What would happen if that would happen within the heart of the church when the spirit of the living God moved upon the heart of the church if the church would move in the direction of what God was telling him to do and set, 
sitting back and trying to psychoanalyze everything that we're hearing and, and, and feeling in our heart, realizing that the Spirit of God is moving. How many times have you heard missionaries and ministers tell how God had to adjust their plans for their life, for their career, so they could walk in the obedience to God's plan? You know, God called Elisha. God called Elisha. What was Elisha doing when he called him? He was plowing. He was plowing. You know, I did some quick reference work last night, and the men that God called that were busy when he called them, they had to make changes on their part, had to so make changes on their part so they could be in the will of where God was calling them to be. Elisha was plowing. Gideon was thrashing. Moses and David were herding sheep. Amos was farming. Peter, James, and John were fishing. And Matthew was collecting taxes. Matthew needed to repent, really. <laughs> but uh, he was collecting taxes. But all of these individuals had to move in the direction that God was calling them to move in. You know, this morning, I be still believe this morning that <laughs> God calls men and women to obey him yet today. Don't you think so? God calls men and women to serve him in a variety of capacities so that they can serve him and be used of them. And walking by faith involves making changes on our part. The Bible says, by faith Noah moved being warned of God of things not seen as yet moved with fear. And then it says, Pre prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness. Noah, his mind was warned, his heart was moved, and his will he acted upon what he heard God say in his heart. You might say, well, I have faith. But faith that is not prepared to make changes in order to walk in obedience to God is really not faith at all. It's not faith at all. The Bible says real faith teaches us that real faith moves in the direction of God's Word. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Noah could not continue the life he was living and build an ark. I don't know what he was doing before the Lord called him. He might have been a carpenter or something of that nature. But he couldn't have been the do what God called him to do and, and, and stay in the former occupation that he had. He had to move in the direction God called him to, to, to move in. Abraham couldn't stay in the land of Ur of Chaldees and be the father of Canaan. Neither could Moses stay in the desert and herd sheep and lead the nation of Israel out of Egypt. And neither could the disciples do that which the Lord called them to do and continue the life they were formerly living. All of these and Hebrews chapter 11 had to adjust their life to the call of God so they could walk by faith in obedience to the Word of God. Walking by faith always involves our obedience to His Word, trusting God for His strength. Day by day, looking to God for that provision. Obedience is costly. Obedience is costly. There's no such thing. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book, wrote, wrote, wrote a book about and in that book, he talks about cheap grace. There's no such thing as cheap grace in this chapter, Heaven's Hall of Fame, chapter 11. Every one of them had to walk in obedience, and it was costly to each and every one of them. They had to make changes in order to be in the center of God's will. Go with me back to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. Let's pick it up in verse 12. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. I want you to understand God has a purpose for each of our lives. You understand that, don't you? God has a purpose for your life and my life. It's not just to sit and soak. He wants to use each and every one of us. And listen to what he says in Philippians chapter 2. Now we're talking about walking by faith. And walking by faith involves making changes on our part. Now watch what it says in verse 12 of Philippians chapter 2. Wherefore, my beloved... As ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean you earn your salvation, not at all. But it means you learn to walk in obedience to the God of heaven who has called you by his grace to faith. You learn to walk in obedience to him because it goes on to say in verse 13, For it is God which worketh in you 
both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God has a plan. God has a purpose that he wants to accomplish in each of our lives. And we need to move in the direction of that purpose. We need to have a communion and fellowship with him and know his will. How do we know his will? Well, we spend time in his word. We listen to his voice. We spend time in prayer. Uh, these are things we talk about all the time. But these are things that are part of working out our salvation, allowing that salvation, that plan, that purpose that God has ordained for each and every one of our lives to come to fruition in our life. If you don't spend time in the Word, you're not going to be a good teacher, I'll tell you that. If you don't spend time in the Word as a minister, you're not going to be a good pastor, I'll tell you that. But it's not just spending time in the Word. It also involves your willingness to be obedient to that Word, to walk in that Word, to walk in the direction of what you're reading and what you're studying. It's not good enough to sit and read and hear it. Begin to apply it. Work it out. Allow it to do what it is intended to do in your life. For it is God, verse 13 says, which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. He has a plan. He has a purpose for each and every one of our lives. Now, what keeps us back? from fulfilling that plan, from fulfilling that purpose. Well, in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, take your Bible and turn there, we're talking about the fact that when God calls us, that this walking by faith involves each and every one of us being willing to make changes on our part to line up with God's plan, God's purpose. When God moves into this old house, God begins to change things in this old house. He begins to change the way you think, the way you act, the way you talk, the places you go to, the entertainment that you take part of. If you're unwilling to allow God to make those changes in your life, then you're not going to grow the way you're going to grow, should grow. You're not going to get to the place where God wants you to be so he can move you on to the next level, the next plateau. You say, well, why should I allow God to do that in my life? I just kind of like my life the way it is. Because God had a great plan an eternity past for each and every one of us to fulfill it his, according to His will. And one day you're going to stand in the presence of Almighty God, and I'm going to stand in the presence of Almighty God, and I'm going to have to give an account of have I been obedient to all that God called me and asked me to do. And if I have it, that's going to be have an effect upon my reward that will be mine for all of eternity. I don't know, but it would seem to me there's going to be paupers in heaven in some sense because they're not going to have much to rejoice in as far as their rewards. They're going to rejoice in their salvation. They're going to rejoice in the fact that they're in the presence of Almighty God. But you realize there are going to be rewards. There are going to be crowns that the God of heaven is going to give to us because of His word to us now, because of our obedience to that word, and we walk by faith in the direction of that word. And if we choose to be self-willed and not do that, we're going to lose reward, and there's going to be a price paid for not having been obedient to the Word of God. Now, notice what it says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. God is working in me. He's working in you. What has to happen in my life and in your life for me to live my best life? Thank you, Joel Osteen. My best life here. What has to happen for me to live my best life here? I, it says verse 20, am crucified with Christ. I, me, the man in me, the flesh in me, has to die at the cross. I've told you many times, there's a man in me, there's the flesh in me. Oh, I know it's there. I know it's there. And I've told you how many times I know it's there. It's there every time I go up town, Brian, there's some old heifer, she won't turn on the green light. You know, I've told you that. The light says, turn left, turn left. She pulls out in the middle of the... <laughs> and she won't turn. I got teeth marks in the steering wheel. Turn. I know there's the flesh in me. I know that. Man says, I'm saved, sanctified, set apart, haven't sinned the last 50 years. You haven't got behind that old heifer, I'll tell you. I've told you before. You don't believe that? You don't believe you haven't got old carnal nature in here? You just go out and herd hogs up the, up the hog chute, get them up the truck to take them out to market. You go out and do that one time. And let me tell you something, brother. Let me tell you something, sister. You will find there is something on the inside of you that will just bubble up like a fountain, that will just start bubbling up on the inside of you, that you want to take that hog and have a pork chop right there. <laughs> Bless you. Amen. It's there. That's right. So I have to deal with the man in me. I have to die daily. I have to be reminded that when I pull up town, go uptown, take my tranquilizer and riddle, breathe deep. 
<laughs> Breathe deep. Because dumb and dumber is going to stop right there in the middle of the intersection. It's not going to do what they ought to do. Relax. Inhale. Isn't that much better? And you come home and you, just, you, you, you don't have the tremors when you come home. You know, you come home, you got the tremors. What happened? you never believe it. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I live. I go out there, and you go out there, and you go to work, and wherever it is, but I have to die daily to Christ, daily to Christ, because there's a flesh in me, and the flesh which I now live in, I live by faith of the Son of God that loved me and gave himself for me. God has a great plan for your life. Now, thirdly, walking by faith requires us to be prepared to adjust our life to God. You look at these men that God has called. I think about Brother Steve uh, Gibson and how God called this man to do the work in the ministry that he does. Brother Steve Gibson certainly has had to learn to adjust his life to God's call. He's a talented man. He's an intelligent man. But he's had to learn to adjust his life to God's call. What does that mean? Go back with me to the book of Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. What God asks of some of the great missionaries that we like to think of, what God has asked of these here in Hebrews chapter 11 that we could go through and read their life and go back into the Old Testament and study their life, God is asking that of each and every one of us. And here's, here's what it is. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, it says this, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him deny himself and take up his cross. I don't know what your cross is. You don't know what my cross is. But whatever that cross is, that's the cross that God has given each and every one of us to bear for his glory and for his honor. He says, let us deny himself. Now, what does that mean? I've written three things down in my notes. It means this. Number one, it means moving, our, moving from our way of thinking to God's way of thinking. <coughs> Deny himself. Oh, how we want to be in control, do we not? How we want to control the situation, how we want to control our finances, how we want to control our decisions, all that we got out there. Well, we got to move in our, from our way of thinking to God's way of thinking. Well, how am I to know how I'm to think? Right here it is, the Word of God. Read it. Study it. When you open this book, ask the Lord to speak to your heart. Not just speak to your heart. Ask God that I might hear your voice speaking to my heart. That I might hear your voice and that I might move in the direction of what you're asking me to do. And I might be prepared to adjust my life to your call. Deny myself of my way of thinking. Secondly, it means moving from my way of doing things to God's way of doing things. And we can look in Hebrews chapter 11, we've mentioned it many times, Abraham's situation and how he didn't have a child and how he wanted to take matters into his own hands and what happened. He made a mess of things, didn't he? And that's what God is saying to us as well. God moves into your heart and my heart. He wants us to live and walk by faith. He wants us to go out here into this world and be difference makers. I don't think he wants us to be living in a commune. I don't, I, don't th I don't think he wants us to just to totally isolate ourselves in the sense from the world. I think he wants us to go out, rub elbows, and make a difference in the world. But at the same time, keeping our eyes on the prize that is before us. Understanding there are certain boundaries we don't cross over when we go out there into the world. So he wants us to do things his way. Thirdly, he wants us to move from the values of the world to God's values which are from heaven. That's what he wants us to do. That's what's acquired, required in adjusting our life. When you moved into that old house, you moved into what that ha had to happen. Where you had to tear down some walls and you had to put up new walls and you had to rebuild the foundation. Well, God does that in your heart. He does that in your heart. And how does he do that? Do that? He does it through the Word of God as you read the Word of God. Now, go back with me to Hebrews chapter 11. With this thought in mind, how God adjusts our life to His call, notice what it says, and we've already read the verse, but we want to pick up on another part of that verse. It says this, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, 
Verse 7, by faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. And I did a little study on that, moved with fear. It means, it means to reverence God, to reverence His Word. When my dad spoke to me, I didn't fear that he was going to beat me up, but I reverenced him. I reverenced him because I loved him. And God wants us to reverence him because we love him. And the thought behind that is we take hold of what God is asking us to do. Sometimes it challenges us. It always will challenge you. God wants to get you out of your little rut, and He wants to expand you. He wants to expand your horizons. He wants to take you places, maybe that you've never been, so that you can do things that you never dreamed you could possibly do. But you have to start one step at a time. And that's, and that's what He does. He wants you and I to take hold of the call that He has given us, the place that He's called you to now, and take hold of it like putting your hand to the plow. Why? Because in verse 6 it says, without faith it is impossible to please Him. Walking by faith caused Noah to escape the judgment that was to come. When you read this chapter, there was a judgment, or this verse, there was a judgment that was to come upon the world. But because Noah walked by faith, he built the ark which saved he and his wife and his children and we see in that a type of salvation because of his obedience to the Lord. I think the question before the house is this morning, will you and I move in obedience to God? Will we move in obedience to his word, what he's called us to do and commanded us to do? If we will, God will take care of our tomorrow, but we need to obey him today. Amen. We need to obey him today. I don't know what the Lord is speaking to your heart about this morning, but we began with that verse of Scripture Back in 1 John chapter 5, who is he that overcometh the world? He that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. I want to ask you a question. Do you know the Lord Jesus is your Lord and Savior? You know, we were talking about that last Wednesday night. There's a lot of family members that talk about the fact that they are Christians. And I've been thinking about that. You know, it's kind of like the Jews and the Judaism. They know Judaism from one end to the other. They knew all the ritual ordinances, the things that were required of them. But they did not recognize Jesus Christ. They did not understand Jesus Christ. They needed to trust him by faith. And you know, it's very possible right here in the church. There are men and women like the Jews. Like the Jews knew Judaism, but they didn't know Jesus. There are men and women, no doubt, in the church, and boys and girls in the church, that know the language of Christianity that know the conduct of Christianity, that knows what Christians are supposed to do, but have never, ever experienced Christ within their heart. And so what they're doing is nothing more than an act. It's not coming from the heart. And that begins with, first of all, understand the fact that I am a sinner, that I have missed the mark, that I have fallen miserably, terribly short of God's righteousness. But God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son to take my place, to push me aside. And He said, I'll take your judgment because I love you. And I'll save you on the condition of you coming to me and believing on me and trusting me as my Lord and Savior, if you'll do that. Maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about your relationship with Him right now. And right there where you are in your pew, or you might want to come to the altar and spend some time at the altar, you'd like to just... Tell the Lord, first of all, I want to trust you today as my Savior. I want to receive you into my heart as my Lord and as my God. And then upon that, you'll make a decision from that point on that your life will change forever and ever and ever because what you'll do then will be because of the Spirit of God in you. The Spirit of God in you. So if you haven't made a decision for Christ, I encourage you to do that today. Maybe you want to come to the altar. Spend some time at the altar. I encourage you to do that as we stand and sing page number 408.
great congregation. Yeah. And we pray, Father, today should there be a heart, a soul here today that is struggling in their walk with you, that they will surrender all to you and walk in obedience to you and your word. Yeah. First of all, knowing you as their Savior. And then second of all, allowing you to be the Lord of their life. Now bless, we pray as we go downstairs, for we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.